you know, as women, we're so expected to show up and give and give and give. And we're so also ingrained to push past our own limits, not nourish ourselves, right? Like as if self-care is indulgence. And so we can end up really struggling with things that we're ashamed to even admit to ourselves, let alone to our colleagues or to our friends or sometimes even to family. Hi, I'm Derek Mills. Welcome to the Glow Podcast. In this episode, my wife, Lisa, she's also Glow's chief impact officer and a co-founder of Glow. She has a lively discussion with Dr. Aviva Ram. They discuss common health issues and concerns facing women today, which are often overlooked or dismissed. Lisa has lived through some of these very issues, having suffered with Hashimoto's, an autoimmune condition for years. Because of that, and because she appreciates Dr. Ram's work, we thought it would be helpful if she was part of the conversation. Lisa and I enjoyed the co-hosting experience so much, it made us realize that we'll likely do it again. Dr. Ram is a medical doctor, midwife, and herbalist who has offered a holistic approach to women's health for over 35 years, bridging the divide between traditional wisdom practices and Western medicine. Her practice emphasizes self-care, finding underlying causes behind the symptoms, and cultivating a synergy with our bodies and our planet. We talk about Dr. Rahm's new book, which will be out in June called Hormone Intelligence, and delve into her efforts in creating a new framework for women to take charge of their health, including an emphasis on connecting to nature, getting enough sleep, and establishing and protecting boundaries. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Dr. Ram, so excited to have you with us today. Hi, Dr. Ram. Hi, you guys. Thank you. Please call me Aviva. Got it. Aviva. Well, it's a beautiful name, so I'm happy to use Aviva too. Thank you. Well, I just wanted to start by saying that today's conversation is near and dear to my heart because I'm a woman, certainly, but also a woman with Hashimoto's hypothyroidism. And I've learned about the connections between autoimmune conditions like Hashimoto's and hormonal health. So I'm excited for Dr. Aviva's new book, Hormone Intelligence, to get out into the world very soon. And Dr. Aviva, I also really appreciate your prior book, which I have a copy of right in my hands here, The Adrenal Thyroid Revolution. I highly recommend this book as well. I've struggled with many of the hormone imbalance symptoms that you address in your work, like brain fog, sleep disturbances, and anxiety, just to name a few. And I really believe that we need to be our own health advocates as much as possible. And this can be hard when dealing with debilitating symptoms, which is why I'm grateful for your experience and work. You offer up important information and tools in a digestible way that doesn't feel overwhelming or intimidating. And as you mentioned in your new book, the helpful guidelines you offer, they really are practical, affordable, and actionable. And to me, your book feels like a safe space, a refuge. And I think coming from you, a woman, a medical doctor, a mother, a midwife, and an herbalist who has been intimately engaging in helping women heal for decades, you offer a holistic approach to help women heal on a deep level. And you as a person just feel so relatable and approachable. For me personally, this helps when dealing with women's health. And I think it's so crucial when addressing these deeply rooted health issues. You really want to feel like you can trust your doctor, that they have your back, that they get you, and that you're not alone. And maybe we could actually begin there with how coping with symptoms can feel so isolating. Yes, Lisa, first I want to just start by honoring you for being transparent about your own struggles. I think as women, um, we often hold back, we feel ashamed, we feel like there's something wrong with us and so we don't disclose. And then I think for women in the wellness space, as we both are, there can be a lot of expectation that you know you do the right diet, you do the right yoga, you do the right this, you think the right thoughts, et cetera, et cetera. And it's all fixed. And all of, of course that stuff really helps, but there can be, I think, added shame and confusion for women in the wellness space who are doing all those things and they're struggling. So I really just want to honor that you um, shared that publicly and openly. 
you know, as women, we're so expected to show up and give and give and give. And we're so also ingrained to push past our own limits, not nourish ourselves, right? Like as if self-care is indulgence. And so we can end up really struggling with things that we're ashamed to even admit to ourselves, let alone to our colleagues or to our friends or sometimes even to family. So that's one aspect that happens. There's another phenomenon that's called um, the invisible illness. And with a lot of hormonal imbalances um, and symptoms that come with them, fatigue, brain fog, or even like severe pain with something like endometriosis or chronic pelvic pain, um, you look fine on the surface. So people look at you and, you know, you're living your life, you're functioning, you look wonderful. And so there's this disconnect with people, how people treat you. And maybe people even seem to think like, well, wh why are you complaining? Or why are you saying that you look great? You seem great. And then you add this whole third layer too, right? So there's the shame about it. There's the invisible illness, people not seeing that you're not doing great when you're not doing great. And then the third part is that a lot of the symptoms that women struggle with have historically, for a lot of reasons, medical bias, lack of education about um, women's conditions, um, a lot of dismissal around women's conditions, end up spending sometimes years getting trying to get a diagnosis, or frankly being told that it's in your head. Like I've had patients who were literally told that, or the flip side is you're given an antidepressant or an anti-anxiety medication, which is kind of sort of saying the same thing when your problem is hormonal or rooted in your physiology. And just to give you an example, women, as you may have experienced yourself, I hope not, but women with Hashimoto's, it can take up to five years and four different doctors to get a diagnosis. Endometriosis, which isn't an autoimmune condition, but is an immunologic and hormonal condition, nine years on average to get a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And women are told, oh, it's normal to be tired. You're a mom, you're running a company. It's normal to have period pain, you're a woman. So we have a lot of confusion and we end up just sort of sucking it up and moving on or medicating and moving on. Yeah, I can definitely relate to both of those timelines you mentioned. And I I definitely relate to this, the invisible illness as you call it that concept where if you don't have a cast on your arm, that's something that's very obvious and visual, and you can see this person is in pain, they're suffering, um, or they're on crutches. But yes, this is completely, you might look fine, you're greeting each day, you're out in the world, but you're you know inside suffering akin to like depression or an anxiety. So on the invisible illness part, that for all the men out there listening, when you know, Lisa was first experiencing the most intense manifestation of her symptoms, my way of handling all of that, uh, because like you said, it's not like a broken arm, something you can see, like my way of handling it fell somewhere in between the spectrum from not helpful to actually contributing to making things worse, you know, in part because it's hidden, like you said, and you know, my energy at the time skewed towards, you know, uh, you can just push through it come on, let's, let's do this. Like, what can we do to solve this? And, you know, I think, you know, going back to that timeline, I think it was in 2012, 2013, I recall like a three to six month period where I wasn't really trying to understand and expand my empathy or, or my thinking was that it would just pass. And if not, let's just solve it and move on. And at the time in my life, if anything slowed me down, like I was just go, go, go. If it was an inconvenience for me, something for me to solve, I had to solve it and solve it quickly. And I really had to shift my mindset to one that was more supportive and patient and really actively seeking to understand just again and again, most importantly, looking at myself and honestly at the shadow aspects of, of myself that were just addicted to being busy, judgmental, and at the time unconscious of my perfectionism and projection. And looking back, I can see how I was not fully available to be supportive in the ways that would have been most helpful to you. And I just say that because I think if I had heard that from a, a man at the time, maybe I would have shifted more quickly. Yes. And for me, like so many, I had been pushing through for years and years, and I really wasn't holding boundaries or stopping myself. 
So my body was saying, I'm going to stop you because you're not stopping. I'm guessing you see this pattern with women you work with. They don't listen to the symptoms and they just push through and end up all the worse for it. Totally. And also this phenomenon happens where I think when and I see this in my patients all the time, they tell me this where, you know, their doctor's telling them they're fine. They look fine. Their partner's like, come on, just push through. You know, if you just work hard enough or like, it's almost like if you get yourself like in enough tone, you know, then you'll be able to cross this threshold as if it's a threshold to cross. And then a lot of women start to think, well, maybe I am just making this up. Maybe mm -hmm. it's not actually really happening. Maybe I am just being like a little wimpy here and I should just push even harder. And then, you know, exactly what you say happens. It's like our bodies are so wise that your body will just do the slowdown for you. It's not going to really actually give you any choice. And I think it's hard as, um, you know, I think men are so programmed and hardwired by our culture to fix it and move on. And no matter how, like my husband's also really progressive and, um, you know, if I ever feel like, okay, I, I like I need to hit pause and I'm like a machine when it comes to getting stuff done. And so he's so used to me being this high functioning person. Like, I'm like, I've had enough. He's like, well, you could just push a little harder. I'm like, actually, no. But then sometimes I'll hear him say that. I'm like, well, maybe I should, maybe I can. <laughs> and he, and, and you know what? It's like, no matter how progressive he is, and maybe um, it's a generational thing too, but I feel like like in his mind, he doesn't see me through stereotypical woman stuff, but his programming actually still does. Mm -hmm. And so the programming sometimes comes out, even though his knowing knows something different, right? So it's complicated. But you know, I think as women, we experience it too. Like, I'm kind of like the primary forward income person in our family. And he works in a company that I created and we co-own, but I created it. And I'll go into these like really outdated moments of like, well, why isn't he like the breadwinner and the knight in shining armor? And then I'm like, where does that crap come from? And we do that to each other. Right. But it's like, yeah. I'm so glad that you mentioned the patterns, you know, it's those complexes that just play themselves out automatically. And that was the big shift for me was, wait a minute, this isn't about you. This is about me first. Like, how do I need to fix myself so that I can be of better service to you? Yeah. And how do we just believe each other when we say stuff, right? It's like, how do, how do we as physicians just believe our patients when they're saying stuff? How do we as partners actually believe each other when we say we're tired or we need space or we need connection or this is going on instead of judging each other and to making it harder. But we do that. Yeah. And it's so hard. I think it's so hard, you know, as women, our entire stereotype that we've internalized is being able to multitask, like as if we have eight arms and, you know, do the dinner and do the kids and do like be these fertile goddess mamas and like all this stuff at one time. And then we blame ourselves when we can't meet an unrealistic expectation. That's right. I think it's heartbreaking at times because we keep covering up rather than getting to the root causes. The body is so wise. It's amazing. You mentioned in your new book, though, that 80% of women struggle with a hormone or gynecologic problem in their lifetime. That That's astounding, truly. It is. Most of those women are probably not truly getting to the root cause, right? They're, they're having a procedure uh, maybe a, even a hysterectomy, they're given pills. Um, and even after those types of dramatic surgeries, they're still dealing with symptoms many a times, right? Um, yeah. I'm just wondering how prevalent is this sort of Band-Aid approach and how, how does it ultimately do end up doing more harm than good? Yeah. You know, when I wrote the chapter in the book where I talk about the statistics, it was interesting because I wrote the book actually pre uh, that chapter way pre COVID. And so the premise of that chapter was there's this hidden hormone epidemic. And with COVID, I was like, wow, that kind of seems trivial in a way. But then I was thinking at some point COVID is going to be done or, or managed. Right. But all these insidious 
problems that women are experiencing were here before and they're still going to be here after. So I was hesitant to put those statistics in because I do feel like they're heartbreaking and I, I don't want to lean into the negative. And obviously the rest of the book is about solutions. But the reality is, is like one in eight women struggle or one in six to eight, depending on the statistics, struggles in her life with a fertility problem enough to go get a consultation at least or treatment. And one in eight women has polycystic ovary syndrome, which carries as many risks as diabetes if it's not treated. Um, one in 10 women has endometriosis, which can cause lifetime you know, pain, or especially like in those reproductive years, pain, painful sex, difficulty getting pregnant. I mean, it's, it's really intense. And um, I would say that very few women ever get anything but a Band-Aid approach because conventional medicine, and you know, I say this with all respect for the medical profession, and I'm so grateful to have gotten the training I have. And it was with wonderful, incredible human beings. Like truly, my my mentors and professors were just people that you want to grow up and be like, you know, in, in their humanitarianism. But medicine itself is based on this very mechanistic industrialized cultural construct of something's broken and you fix it or you don't even recognize that it's broken which is happening a lot as i mentioned for women's health conditions but once a diagnosis is made really um i think it was maslov who said um if all you have is a hammer then you see everything as a nail right. and conventional medicine basically only has a hammer it's got surgery and it's got medications and there's very little else. I mean, even psychiatry where people used to talk to each other is now, you know, the 15 minute appointment to get your pharmaceutical refilled in a lot of situations. So most women never have an understanding because most doctors don't have an understanding that these conditions, one, don't start when you get the diagnosis, right? The condition's been brewing for years or decades. Right. And that um, the answers are way more complex so that even if you treat with a pharmaceutical or treat with a surgery, it doesn't eliminate all the factors that led to that diagnosis, that disease or condition happening. So um, there's this concept now that kind of got brought to light maybe around 2013 that our periods are our sixth vital sign that for women menstrual health is actually indicative of our hormonal balance our microbial health our immunologic health inflammation even mental health and so ignoring these physical symptoms or or physical conditions doesn't actually do anything but control symptoms. And it may do that really well, but it doesn't address what's the immunologic imbalance that is happening that may alter ultimately lead to another medical condition, for example. And so that's, you know, really important. And I can tell you, I had seven years of medical training, four years of resident, uh, four years of medical school, three years of residency. There were two classes on nutrition ever. I taught one mm -hmm. and the other one was taught by a celebrity doctor who read a poem for the first half of the 40 minute <laughs> class. That was it. Wow. It's seven years. And that was, that was Yale yeah. and Tufts. Um, it's just, that's what most doctors get. Uh, I really hope that is starting to change. Nutrition is so crucial. Um, you mentioned the six vital sign looking at menstrual cycles. I think this piece is so important. And to anyone listening that is beyond the menstrual cycle phases, you mentioned that even if you are in a, a perimenopausal or men menopausal stage, that this is still very important to look back and track and look at the patterns and see what those experiences were like, because this can help give a more insightful um, picture into health. Is that right? Yes. Yes. I like to think of our, our experiences as people in, in these female bodies as kind of an arc and that arc, you know, it's happening in our mom's wombs because our own eggs and ovaries are formed when we're in our mother's wombs. And then it goes, you know, we kind of have this lull where our hormones aren't too active. Our, our female hormones aren't too active when we're children. But then once we hit our menstrual cycle or, or puberty and then menses, like we have this arc over our lives. And so 
how you experience your menstrual cycle really can give us information on what your hormonal baseline is like. And that can tell us, for example, how your menopause might be. And that can tell us how your older years might be, your bone health, your cognitive health. So it's all really important to look back on. So when even if I have a woman who comes to me and she's 65 and she hasn't had a period and, you know, 15 years, um, I'll still want to ask, want to know, well, what were your cycles like when you were having them? It can tell me a lot. It's so important to have that full picture, that holistic perspective. It's one of the things I love about you. You know, oh, thank you. It's all, it's like also such a beautiful, you know, it's not just about the pathology. When I was in my um, teenage years, I was really fortunate to have a mentor. She actually wrote the first ever prenatal yoga book in the United States ever, like oh, wow. actually in the world. Her name was Janine Parvati Baker and she's passed away now, but she was a midwife and an herbalist and a yoga teacher and an astrologer. And she showed me really early on how to understand and interpret my own moods, my own preferences, my own like internal signs through the various stages of my cycle. So I was really young when I learned that I, mean, I was a teenager, but that has really been like, I call it me search, like instead of research, but it's like the best inner guidance um, that we can really learn to enjoy and value and as a way to tune into ourselves too. And also to be more aware of how we can nurture ourselves throughout our cycles and our life cycles. So it's not just about like figuring out what's wrong, but also what information we can learn about ourselves and our, ourselves in relationship to nature and our love lives and our food preferences and how we move our bodies throughout our cycles in our lives. There is something to that. I mean, you start to realize and get this sense of this is what fills me. This is what drains me. And you start to protect that fiercely. And you start to really reckon this food really nourishes me. I feel like this. This food makes me feel, you know, fatigued X, Y, Z or this person or this place. Or as you said, spending time in nature, that really fills me. So I'm going to do more of that. And you start to see these patterns. And I think it's important. I think it seems like women, and you can tell me if this is what you're seeing in your practice, it's like once you get a taste of that, once you see and f actually feel that in your cells, you want to do more of that. And you start to really protect that with grace. That's a practice, protecting it with grace, but also with some fierce, fier fierceness. Totally. I, um, I remember many years ago, um, someone had given me a copy of Danielle Laporte's um, forget what it was called, like fire starter book or something like that. And it was like journaling exercises. And one of the questions that she said is to ask yourself how you really want to feel. And she said, learning how you want to feel and creating that is one of the most radical things that we can do. And I've really taken that to heart and include that as a, like a really important question that I ask my patients and that also I, you know, share in my books. Um, I think that once you start to pay attention to how you do feel, I couldn't agree with you more. Like you start to really notice what works and what doesn't if you're paying attention to your body and if you're willing to listen and, and respect that too. Right. Absolutely. I love that you have your top 10 permission to pause list in the book. And this is just one of the many nuggets in your book. There are so many of these little and big <laughs> treasures. It's like a little treasure trove. There's just so much inspiration and you feel so much hope when reading the book. If you just pull one or two nuggets a day and put them into action, you're on your way. I think it's important to remember that it took some time, in some cases decades, to get where you are today. And it's going to take some time to start to feel better. So if you can integrate some of these healthful nuggets you offer, healing can begin to take place. It's really a journey. You can just keep coming back to the book as a resource guide to keep committed to a wellness journey. I love that. Yeah, for me, the book, and it's so funny how pub the publishing world is like, my publisher was like, we want you to write a two week guide to hormone balance. I'm like, I'm not doing that. Nobody can do fix their hormones in two weeks. And uh, I was like, <laughs> let's start with maybe 12 weeks. And we negotiated down to where I put in the book, you know, like this is a six week plan, but you can do it over 12 weeks. You can do it over how long you want to do it, but think about yeah. it as not like 
a wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Now your hormones are fixed or now your endometriosis is better or now you're pregnant, but which would be great. I mean, I guess that would be the one thing now you're pregnant in three months. It's really nice. But um, if you want to be, but um, really that this is a lifestyle Mm -hmm. plan, that it's really about a way of being, that it's not just a start and stop, but that we have to nurture our bodies every day with good food and that um, sleep is essential health self-care is non-negotiable um but it's also really um a flexible plan too it's not about being rigid or strict it's about really creating a nourishing lifestyle progress over perfection i love that (laughs) i love um concepts in general that highlight interconnectedness and so um my cells just started sort of dancing when i was reading about exposing science Mm-hmm. Could you I give, did that too? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I just could you just give a brief overview and of exposing science and how this holistic model is needed in helping get to the root cause of health imbalances? Yeah. So exposome science, it's kind of what it sounds like, what we're exposed to. And it is a branch of science that's been emerging over the past decade and a half. There's actually a center for exposome science, for example, at Columbia University. And it started arising out of the toxicology world. So while medical doctors basically aren't really taught that there are environmental influences, microbiome influences, nutritional influences, you know, environmental toxins that we're exposed to, um, other branches of science like toxicology or microbiology or endocrinology, like they're more aware of um, in many ways of these sort of more subtle influences, but they're not actually that subtle. They're big influences. So exposome science basically says that as human beings, we lie at the intersection of two intersecting circle. So like a Venn diagram. And on one side are all of the external exposures that we get. That can be childhood trauma or adult trauma or any trauma. It can be um, uh, multiple rounds of antibiotics or pharmaceuticals that we have growing up. It's our diet. It's the stress in our lives. It's all the external influences. And then we have these other influences, which are internal. So the state of our microbiome, our stress set point and our resilience, our immunologic health, the actual nutrients that we do or don't have in our body. And so these two ecosystems, essentially, as I call them, this external ecosystem and this internal ecosystem contain all the influences that we might consider root causes. And so I love it because one, conventional medicine tends to um, separate things into silos, right? You go to your endocrinologist, your cardiologist, your gastroenterologist, you've got your head, your gut, your heart, right? But they're all seen as these separate entities in a way with separate technicians that take care of them. With exposome science, it's saying we're all interconnected. It's all interconnected. We can't separate our personal health from what we eat, from the health of our planet, from the way systemic racism might impact us, the way stress might impact us, the way having 20 antibiotics by the time we're 18 years old, which is the average in the United States, 20 rounds by the time we're 18 impacts us. And I love it because I'm kind of a geek actually. Like I'm the, I'm the like, hippie girl with the textbook that I'm reading. I'm so like, I have so many contradictions like that, but I am very much a science geek and I love it. And it's not, it's not that like I need science to validate or prove what I believe or do. It's that I get these moments, just like you said, my cells start dancing when I'm like, Oh, that explains it. You know, that explains how this all works. And that's what exposome science is doing. And it's still living in these more academic institutions, but it really was the toxicologists who were saying, Hey, there's a lot more going on to human health than just sort of our genetics. And in fact, our genetics are being altered or shaped or epigenetic changes are happening based on what people are getting exposed to the phthalates, the BPA, the BPS, the, DDT that's in our environment, all of that. And our ability to withstand these stresses has to do with how much stress we had as a kid and our resilience and tolerance and what our nutritional status is. And Oh, hey, the microbiome is playing a big role in it too. 
So it's very, very cool. So I take that concept and apply it in a much more accessible, digestible way in the book, highlighting these various areas and how they influence our hormonal and gynecologic health and then what we can do about them. I think that's so great because this is what gives you, this is part of the piece that gives you this whole, truly holistic approach. I just wanted to highlight one of the things in, you said in the book on Exposum Science because again, I was geeking out about this part and I, my heart was like glowing. Um, Exposum Medicine, well, first of all, you say that it's the perfect medicine for us being women. Um, Exposum Medicine also reveals the importance of what ancient philosophers eco-feminists, and indigenous cultures believe that women's bodies are a microcosm of the greater environment we all live in. We can't separate what's happening in our culture, our lives, our diets, our environment, our microbiome, and our minds, moods, from what's going on in our health. The diseases we are seeing are diseases of our modern living and of a planet in distress, reflected in women's bodies. We're all connected and our individual problems are also a collective one. I think this is so beautiful and just sums up how, first of all, women are so intertwined with nature's, nature and nature cycles. I think you even mentioned sort of this spider web concept in your book, where if you pull on one string, you know, everything else is connected. I think that's so beautiful and such a really great approach to look through that lens when you're helping heal women. And I like how you point out too that these exogenous or these environmental factors disproportionately affect women. Yes, they do. They do. I hope that the book on the one hand is, you know, very solution oriented um, for women and that it really starts to set a messaging and languaging for a whole new medicine because I don't believe that we can be well if our planet's not well. Our planet can't be, well, our planet probably could be well if we're not well and we're not here. But I, you know, I'd hope that would never come to pass that we can recognize the incredible importance of our beautiful planet on our well being and that it's a call to change the things that we're doing that make us sick. And in doing that, hopefully all the little individual fires that we set of like hope and change will actually have an influence on the planet. And, you know, Margaret Mead said it, and I know that it's been said so much that it may even seem trivial, but never doubt what a small group of dedicated people can do. Right. And I mean, if we could reach millions with this idea, with this understanding that ancient people have always had and have always lived in harmony with their planet is that we, ha we have to take care of this mother earth that, and that we, you know, I really, hope for in the book too, is that in understanding that, that we take the blame off of ourselves as women, you know, I think one of the challenges and dangers that I've seen in the wellness world with its emphasis on cleansing and detoxing, and there's a certain hidden striving for perfection and a certain aspect that almost says that we're broken, that we're not whole, that we're not clean enough. Um, and that if we did just do all the right things, you know, as I said earlier, if we ate the right diet, did our meditation every day, that all of the things that ail us would also not ail us anymore. But so many women come and they sit down in my office and they're, they're already yoga teachers. They're already nutrition gurus, but they're still struggling with these problems too. And they're like, what am I doing wrong? And I can look at them in the eye and say, you're not doing anything wrong. And you could be doing everything perfectly, but you didn't have any control over that lifelong exposure to those phthalates that you were getting in that body lotion that your mom had no idea was harmful. Or I've, I've literally had patients who have come to me, they're in their 30s and have been on 30 and 40 rounds of antibiotics for urinary tract infections, for other gynecologic infections for strep throat. And then they come and they have chronic hormonal imbalances that we can track back to microbiome damage, for example. And it's not that we can prove that those things caused it, but I think it takes such a burden off of us 
of feeling like if that we've done something wrong, it's our fault. And if we just do it all perfectly and right, it's all going to be perfect and fine. And it's more complex than that. And I think we need to give ourselves that understanding and that compassion. Oh, I just love that whole message. I mean, so much of what we want to convey through glow and through this podcast, our messages like that. Yes. I love that message too. One of the things I love saying is take care of yourself because our world needs you. It's a notion that personally inspires me because I want to be of service to those around me in our world, but not sacrifice my health. I mean, really what good am I to the world if I can't function? I need to be functioning well in order to do that. And I think these symptoms, these hormonal imbalance symptoms can seriously suck the joy out of life. One of the things you speak about is this perfect storm, this perfect storm of being undernourished and overwhelmed. And I think we touched on a bit earlier, but I, I think it's sort of what is happening and has been happening and keeps on happening. It's sort of like we need to play catch up and heal from the past. And then we need to find ways to cope and sustain ourselves in this current world where we're undernourished and feeling overwhelmed. So how do you feel we best heal from past traumas, exposure to chemicals, et cetera, and sort of sustain and maintain? It's a little bit like what you said earlier, um, you know, figuring out what you love and doing more of that and figuring out what drains you and doing less of that. And it's sort of taking that concept and making it into a thing that I can use repeatedly with my patients and teach other women, which is how do we think of our health as what areas of my life, whether it's my diet, stress levels, whatever, you know, having too many things on my plate, whatever it is that are overburdening me. So where am I overtaxed? And then what are the areas of my life where I'm undernourished? And so that could be creative time, self-care, eating enough, sleeping enough. And it's so simple, but they're just those two questions that help me truly actually when I'm in working with a patient think, okay, well, what's going on here that is actually stressing out her system? And what can we peel back of that? And what is going on here that she is just not getting enough of what she needs? It could be vitamin B6. It could be a vacation, whatever, but what do we need to add in? And I find that to be really helpful. And I think that as women, just as people, I mean, it could be any of us, if we can stop once a day, even maybe in the morning and say, all right, how do I kind of set my day so that I can look at what was too much yesterday, not enough and get that today. And at the end of the day, you know, maybe unpack that what went well today that I really got enough of what I needed and what was not working for me. And it's essentially, you know, exactly those two questions you posed earlier. Yeah. And I think, as you mentioned earlier, when you got to this space as your husband, you, you were pushing through, pushing through, pushing through. And he's like, oh, we'll just push through, you know, one more lap around the track. When in fact, you've learned what that one more track, one more lap around the track will do to you. You know, the consequences of that. So to say, I'm going to try it differently this time, I'm going to sit and meditate, or I'm going to do a yoga nidra, or I'm going to just lay down on the grass for an hour. And then you'll have even more energy to get through that next lap. But we are sort of programmed in our culture to push and push and push. And we've been paying the consequences of that. I read this statistic a few years ago, and I think this has held true for a long time now, which is that we are the only country in the sort of Western world where we don't even take all of our paid vacation. Mm. And we have less vacation than most other, at least Western nations. We're just not, we tend to not value downtime, quiet, you know, we, I, I remember hearing someone said, we're so busy being human beings, human doings and not human beings. Um, but yeah, it, we have to, you have to hit pause long enough to find that place that actually does feel really good. So that becomes the touchstone that you come back to. So for me, for example, I had an experience about eight years ago, something had happened professionally 
and it was it was actually quite intense and i got off of this very like major phone call that was very stressful and i thought that i would be stressed when i got off the phone but i had this complete feeling of completion and inner quiet do you know when you're in an electrical storm and all of the electricity in your house goes out and so it's so quiet like you all of a sudden you're like, oh, I forget that I hear the refrigerator all the time, or I forget that I hear the hum of the fan all the time. It was just complete, absolute stillness inside of me. And I had that feeling. I had that feeling of like all the electricity going out in the best sense of the way, like just complete fundamental quiet. And now that feeling has been, has become the touchstone for me. So when I'm starting to feel amped up or taking on too much I feel how far away I am from that feeling. And then I can recall that moment. And so I encourage people to find some moment that's a touchstone, you know, whether it's lying in a hammock or a moment laughing with your kids or whatever that is. And if you don't have one that you've had the privilege to experience just true peace or quiet, like imagine one and try to feel that at least for a minute every day, just try to remember what inner happiness or stillness feels like, because then the further away you are from it, you catch yourself. Well, you catch yourself earlier. So you don't go out as far and you come back faster. Right. Healing and creating the ability to be more resilient. And of course the learnings, so many great learnings went on a healing journey. Your book is so complete and comprehensive, like a resource guide that it, it really touches on every area of healing in a holistic way. And I so appreciate what you said about this being a book that you can come back to and back to. We've actually been looking for a way to say that because that's been a feeling um, just a couple of internal readers have said is this feels like a book I could keep coming back to over different points in my life. And I was really hoping to create that. So I really honor and appreciate that you said that. I think you did it. And I feel the same about the adrenal thyroid. Revival. I mean, it's the same thing. It's it's I also feel like this is a book you can, you know, continue to come back to. Yeah. I'm curious to know if you're open to sharing, if you've had any specific debilitating hormonal imbalance symptoms in your life, having gone through four pregnancies and so on. Yeah. So I have been oddly and really um, gratefully fortunate. And I don't know why exactly, but I have really been blessed to have completely smooth sailing truly through my gynecologic I and mean, I had easy periods, no PCOS, no endometriosis, um, no fertility challenges for kids born at home, no problem with my pregnancies. And I'm now officially in menopause. I hit menopause at um, 53 or yeah, I was fully at the end of, like I fully was in menopause at 54. So I would say the only thing that I have struggled with, um, I would say two things. Um, that day when I felt like all the lights went out and like the electricity went out and I felt um, that inner quiet, part of what had happened was I actually stepped away from a very high powered job and the person I was working for um, hated me for it. And so it was very personally threatening and professionally threatening. And um, when I got really internally quiet, I had just gotten off a phone call where I really held my ground and really spoke my truth. And that deep inner quiet was an awareness that I didn't have to strive and achieve to be safe. And so what I identified for myself in that moment was that I had been living with and definitely struggle with and have to catch myself about high functioning anxiety. So I grew up in a housing project. I left home at 15 to go to college, which means I had already applied and been accepted when I was 14. So just to give you a perspective, I wanted the heck out of there, home and environment. And so for me, in order to be safe, I had to um, continue to be like highly, or let me back up and say, what I found as a child was that my intellect, my achievements were very highly valued. 
by my mom, by my family, and by my school teachers. And so they kept me safe and they got me special attention, um, you know, extracurricular support, activities, praise, awards, and all of that. And then ultimately I was able to use that as a ticket out of a housing project, a very stressful home. And um, it really wasn't until about seven or eight years ago when that moment of stillness truly, truly happened. And look, I've been meditating, doing yoga, you know, psychedelics were a part of my early exploration when I was a teenager. Um, I've experienced inner quiet, but this was something different. And it was at that moment that I realized that I had never, my psyche had never caught up to the fact that I was now safe. And so it was a shift for me in how I live my life and that I'm able to live my life now more doing things that resonate with me and not just saying yes and taking things on because they're somehow like important or an achievement or they're going to get me value or praise. My value is coming from a very different place. The only other thing that I have struggled, the only thing I would say I've struggled with hormonally has been this past year since hitting menopause. But I think that it was more like an accumulated thing of, I don't know, stress over time that started at that moment. What I was talking about, that whole situation um, was hair loss. And I will say that, um, you know, I feel like in the past year, since my hormones have changed, I have lost like a third of my hair. And that has been a real wake up call for me. Um, but also just getting older as a woman. I mean, in my 30s and into my like late 40s, I always look like I was 28 or 30 and had a certain like unselfconscious physical appearance that I didn't identify as beautiful. But now looking back on um, certain factors in my life and certain eases that I've had, um, you know, like there was a study done. This is shocking, but a study done that medical schools and residencies are more likely to select you in the top tier of their program if you're more standardly or like objectively, whatever this means, physically attractive. And so I would say um, getting older and definitely seeing like my facial structure changing, I'm not jumping on the like Botox fillers, that's just not my way. Um, but in a, even in the wellness space, when there are so many women, even young women who are like fashion models who are doing those things, it's very challenging. And so that's not so much just strictly like a hormone problem, but it's like something that happens with changing estrogen and age that I'm definitely learning to find peace with um, uh, how we naturally age and what that looks like in a world that doesn't show us that readily and how to embrace that with grace. Um, and, you know, at the same time, like acknowledging that as we go through different phases in our life, whether we become a mother and we have a moment or parts of us that are mourning who we were before, because we have a new identity as a mom that is the old person, but it's not also, I think also for me in this transition in my life, that's probably what I'm exploring the most. And I feel like there aren't a lot of good, um, like landmarks for it and guidance for it and how to not identify with physical appearance. And at the same time, like feel beautiful, however we are at any age. So that's probably the biggest thing. And then, you know, understanding how much value is placed on hair in our culture. And, um, you know, I think people looking at me visibly, they're like, what you're struggling with hair loss. But if I look at pictures of myself three years ago, five years ago, um, it's, it's really astonishing. And, um, you know, it's like people who struggle with acne. We don't think of acne as something that can cause anxiety and depression, but it's a major cause of anxiety and depression. And now learning more about hair loss for women being a major cause of anxiety and depression. And for men, you can be Vin Diesel and like you're hot, but if you're a woman, no, not so much. Right. With, not having hair. Yeah. I mean, unless you're like Demi Moore in, <laughs> you know, and you shave your head and you're Demi Moore, that's different, but, um, it's not fair. No. Right. And, um, you know, you can do one arm pushups, you can get away with anything, but, uh, looking at the, the statistics around acne or hair loss, they're really staggering. Like the amount of women that experience rage or depression. And then I got this article 
um, that was in the New York Times maybe like a year ago, and it was a backstage peek at Fashion Week. So it was before COVID, it was the year before COVID. It was New York Fashion Week. And the article was in the New York Times, I believe, and it was featuring hair. And it was just showing gobs and gobs and gobs of like fake hair, hair inserts that these models are wearing. Um, so like, there's no benchmark, you know, kind of going back to all the hormonal stuff, there's no benchmark for what's real and what's normal and even what real appearance for women is like. So I've been really fortunate. It's just been this life cycle change that's brought up my relationship to hormones in that way. That's helpful. Thank you for sharing. And it's so true about hair. We could probably have a whole podcast episode on that. And, and maybe you could add on just like, I would be curious to know if you have some non-negotiables for you, like when it comes to sleep or when it comes to how much you take on your plate, if you have any thing in your life or you or boundaries that you try to protect that you want to share. Yeah, I do. Um, so I really am pretty non-negotiable about my body products, my food, and my clothing and furnishings. I feel a tremendous personal responsibility to our planet. So I really do try to not buy things that are in plastic to the extent that is humanly possible. You know, I don't have any treated furniture around my house. Um, my skincare is 100% organic. And, and to the extent that I can, I keep it really limited, really minimal, and try to use only things that come in completely sustainable packaging. Um, and then food, I am pretty... Yeah, I've been eating a plant-based diet, which I think probably is why I've been so fortunate with my hormonal health too. I mean, I've been on this path since I was 15 years old. So 40 years now solidly of eating a truly plant-based, um, no, I'm not vegan or vegetarian anymore, but if I do have meat or any dairy, it's organic, it's local. Like I live in the Berkshires, we can get everything local here. So that's all non-negotiable for me. Um, I don't like never ever eat sugar. I don't never ever have like, something like that. I don't never ever have a glass of wine, but it's, it's pretty rare that I do. Um, sleep is non-negotiable. I really am committed to getting a good seven hours a night. I tend to, that's my sweet spot is seven, seven and a half hours. So I'm very committed to getting bed. I wake up early, basically, no matter what time I go to bed. So like eight o'clock would be sleeping late for me. So I have to kind of reverse engineer my sleep to go to bed at a reasonable time to get a good seven hours. And I'm pretty good about screen time. Like I'm on my screen when I have to be, but I'm not a big social media follower. I find that the compare and despair and FOMO and all that stuff, it just, it just interacts with my high performance anxiety in not a good way. So I just tend to send some love when I can to other people's feeds and then stay off of it. Um, and then time outdoors. I mean, time in nature is another non-negotiable for me, getting in my garden, getting dirty, getting my fingernails in the soil um, in the season that I can. And if not, just getting out and hiking, even in colder weather. Those are also really important to me. Laughing, dancing. I'm a crazy dance, solo dance party person. I'm so glad that you bring up nature so much in your book and connecting with nature and the sort of digital detox and get out and spend time on the earth if you can. And if you can't just even be around plants and tend to your plants and trim them and, and clean them and, you know, thank them and just, just connecting with nature in any way, sort of way that you can. I mean, you even mentioned forest bathing and earthing and grounding. Um, in my experience, these touch points are so crucially important. When I have a day of being on the computer all day working and not taking mini breaks to go put my feet on the earth, I feel it. And when I have a day where I've just wake up and get right to a park for a walk, it's a completely different day for me. So it's so great to have these gauges and these reference points and sort of keep track of like, oh, wow, this really made me feel good. I'm going to make sure that I do that again. And if I can't, how can I integrate it into a day to just even go out and stand under a tree or touch a tree for a few minutes and just close my eyes and sink my feet into the to the soil. Totally. I have really been paying deep attention for the past two years to 
the different experience we have, I think it's just like maybe neurocognitively when we are looking at a screen all day, our eyes are focused in this very narrow frame of reference. And then we go outside and it's this whole expanded field of vision. And I feel like traditional peoples, I mean, they also focused, right? I mean, women have always done fine beadwork, fine weaving, things that required a very intense focus on a, a, a narrow field visual object. But then life was also, you would look up, you would look out. And I've been noticing, for example, um, through the different times of day and even have woken up at night a few times when I've had my window open to intentionally try to hear what sounds are happening at night. That I think that the different lighting, the different colors of sky, the different sounds of insects and birds are part of our important neural wiring. And that when we don't get those, it's actually affecting our cognitive function and our mood, that there's something actually therapeutic about hearing peepers when you're going to sleep and March through September or the way the light hits your eyes at different times of year. And I, I, I think that there's just a powerful therapeutic aspect to nature that probably would translate at a very physiologic level that just hasn't been explored enough, or, or maybe it is being explored. And I just don't know those studies and that science. Yeah. I've actually been reading a lot about that exact thing about light and the importance of it for us to take in, especially I think taking it in through the eyes. We all wear sunglasses so often. There is something to that to have some exposure without sunglasses on. I just really love the dedication. Would you mind reading that to our listeners? I would be happy to. For those who have been told you are too sensitive, too outspoken, too emotional, too hormonal, own it. It's your inner guidance system. It's a superpower. For all who have put your confidence in me as a doctor, healer, teacher, and who have shared your struggles and healing stories, thank you. I am always listening. For the girls now, the women of tomorrow, may you inherit a world in which you can thrive and that honors your agency over your body. And for my daughters, goddaughter, and granddaughters to come. Beautiful. I started tearing up. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I think that says so much about you as a person. I mean, especially the listening piece. I think, I feel like I get the sense rather that that's what's really helped inform your message today and your passion for, for helping women is that you've had these, I mean, can't imagine the countless number of women that you've sat down with and that you've truly listened to their stories and what data points? I mean, that, that's, that's valuable information <laughs> to then go on and help other people with. So thank you for being this, this sage, if you will, and in, in sharing this important, important, helpful information with us. Um, that is kind of you. Thank you. Oh, of course. Thank you. So the, the actual release date is coming this June. Is that right? Uh, June 8th, which is so fun because it's the day after my birthday. Oh, happy early birthday. <laughs> We're going to have a party. Okay. We're going to have an online party to celebrate. The <laughs> public, a public party. That's awesome. Well, that'll be a fun way to celebrate your birthday with the release of this gift to the world. There is just so much goodness in your book, so much helpful information. Since we can't get into every topic today, I wonder if you could share with us the titles of the chapters just to help give some insight into what's covered. Yes. Okay. It starts out with the introduction. You are not broken. Part one, know yourself, understanding hormone intelligence. Chapter one is the hidden hormone epidemic. Chapter two is the language of your cycles. Chapter three is your sixth vital sign. Chapter four is what your symptoms are saying and why it's important to listen. And chapter five is you are your own best healer. Then in part two, find balance, the hormone intelligent plan. There is nourish, eating for hormone health, out of survival mode, the stress hormone connection. It's about time, reset your body clock to sync your hormones, the world within you, the gut hormone connection, our planet, your body, the detoxification hormone connection, and revitalize cellular repair, rejuvenate your ovaries. 
Then part three is called get personal. And that's where I provide the advanced natural protocols, which are built onto the root cause parts of the program, which were the chapters I just read. So chapter 12 is period and PMS advanced protocol. Chapter 13 is polycystic ovary syndrome advanced protocol. Chapter 14 is the endometriosis advanced protocol. Chapter 15, the fertility advanced protocol. Chapter 16, uterine fibroids advanced protocol. Chapter 17, down there, sexual and vaginal health advanced protocol. And chapter 18, perimenopause advanced protocol. Then there's an author's note called hormone wisdom. And then part four is called the Hormone Intelligence Kitchen, which is a ton of recipes and I love to cook. So these are actually, except for two of the recipes are recipes that I've developed over the years that I cook in my own kitchen and share with my patients and are great for hormone balance. I was excited to see that if you pre-order your book, you get some extra goodies from your site, which you're, I was just commenting to you at the beginning of this call that your site is just so beautiful and you had just a wealth of information here through your courses. If you could share a little bit about what's offered if you order your book. Yeah. So because there was a gap between when the book goes on sale for pre-order and when you actually can get it in your hands, unless you're interviewing me and then you get a, a copy like you did electronically, um, we I wanted to make some beautiful gifts available that could help nurture women along the way till they till the book arrived and to kind of get them started. So the first thing you get um, when you pre-order the book, and if somebody pre-ordered the book not through my website, you went to Amazon, you went to your local bookstore, just grab your receipt because you can still get these gifts by typing a number in there, you know, and letting us know you bought it or sending a selfie with the book or something like that later on when you get it. But um, these gifts start with an, a reading by me of chapter one. So you get a sneak peek at chapter one, you get the physical copy of a PDF and hear me read it. And then the second gift you get is a seven day hormone quick start guide. So I actually went into the book and picked seven different daily um little focus points that really, really make a difference that you can get started on now that may actually in and of themselves be really transformative, but also kind of get you set and in the mindset of doing the book. So each day has um, something inspiring um, for self-care. And then, you know, one day is built around some things you can do for food the next day around stress, then sleep, then your gut, et cetera. So it mirrors the book a bit, but it's just one little focal point. And then the third thing that'll roll out closer to when the book is available is um, a mini little webinar with me on really how to bring this alive in your life with a focus on that chapter, um, our planet, our bodies, really emphasizing the things that we can do at home that are simple, but actionable and really effective. Like one study, for example, found that teenage girls who simply stopped using body lotions that had phthalates in them, which is a plasticizer, and um, stopped drinking out of plastic cups and plastic water bottles, substantially lowered their blood phthalate levels, which those act as an endocrine or hormone disruptor. So they're, um, that's what this webinar is going to emphasize. And then there are some special treats that are rolling out too. So um, we have some special events that are going to be announced, like the birthday festivity, which will be available to the public, but then also um, kind of like a little um, weekend intensive um, summit type of event with some special guests that is going to happen around the book launch too. Oh, that's so fun. I'm definitely signing up for some of those. It's going to be really fun. Yes. And I'm really excited. And we'll post the link in the show notes. This conversation has been so wonderful. I wonder if you could offer our listeners a few ways to get started on this healing journey. Absolutely. I know we've talked a lot about the book, but I always want people to know that there's a ton of free information. You don't have to buy the book to get started on your hormone health or your general health. You can head over to my website, avivaram.com. There are categories that are easy to search and tons of free information on microbiome, environmental health, your hormones, and so forth. So you can head over there anytime. And then if you do pre-order the book or purchase the book, 
I have some really wonderful gifts to also get you started. So you get to hear me reading chapter one of the book that'll come to you as an audio and you'll get the written copy of that too. And then there is a seven day quick start guide, which highlights seven key components of the hormone intelligence journey that you can get started on anytime. And we, they're truly simple. Like even the meals in them are like 15 minute things that you can do to, so truly quick start. And then there is a webinar that you will get um, that is really focused on the environmental impacts that are affecting our hormones and super actionable, straightforward things that you can do to reduce your exposure and reduce what we call body burden. Beautiful. I love that you offer up things that are so easy because as you mentioned, we are feeling overwhelmed most times and we don't want to take anything else on that's going to overwhelm us. So I love that it's just very easy and we appreciate that. In the first chapter, you know, you, it says here that it will leave you feeling inspired, supported, and ready for more. And I can truly attest to that. It definitely leaves me feeling inspired, supported, and ready for more. And so I'm just excited. I just feel like women really need this type of support. It can, it can make us feel, it's, these symptoms can make us feel isolated. For me, especially, um, having dealt with debilitating symptoms when you feel like you just don't have a place to go. So that's why I, I hope anyone listening that's been suffering and just coping and just getting along, you deserve way more than just getting by, you know, sort of okay. You deserve to just be dancing with joy as much as possible. And so I hope that their book, your book rather, makes it into their hands and that they can benefit from all this valuable information. Well, it means the world to me. And especially coming from you too, I so value the teachers you bring to the world. I so value glow. I so value that I have a place that I can send. Literally, I tell my patients and my listeners all the time, like you don't have to go far or work hard to get a great class. And you've added so much with Pilates and it's just so many great new features in there. So I love what you guys are doing too. And I really so appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, Dr. Aviva, I don't want this time to end with you, but hopefully we can have you back sometime. I would love that. Thank you both for having me. It really means a lot to me. Awesome. Thank you. It means a lot to us too. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you to our entire team behind the scenes at GLOW. I'm so grateful for your care and commitment to serving our members around the world. Thank you to our teachers for so beautifully sharing your gifts and talents. I'm also grateful to our lovely community of GLOW members. You've supported us since 2008, and because of you, we get to continue to do the work we love. It's the combined support of our team, our teachers, and our community that grants me the privilege to continue to bring you the GLOW podcast. Thank you to Lee Schneider at Red Cub Agency for production support. And the beautiful music you're hearing now is by Carrie Rodriguez and her husband, Luke Jacobs. And remember, take care of yourself because our world needs you. Thank you for coming on this journey with me. You can find the Glow Podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or glo.com slash podcast, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. I'm Derek Mills.